Hi everyone, I'm Sarana. I um, did my PhD in bioinformatics uh, at the Genome Sciences Center in Vancouver and then did my uh, postdoctoral training at SickKids um, where I did a lot of cancer research work um, and cancer genomics. And now I've started my own lab at the University of Calgary. So I've been part of the CBW for about five years or so now. Um, and I'm doing two modules, so the copy number variations module now and the module tomorrow morning uh, where we're going to talk about mutations. Um, and when I uh, started participating as an instructor, I did uh, take some slides from uh, previous lectures by Sorab Shah, uh, who's a, a faculty member at the BC Cancer Agency in BC. So thanks to him for some of those slides. Um, and as I go through, um, it would be great if you guys uh, ask any questions so that we can make sure that concepts are clear uh, before getting to the end of the talk. And so it's kind of structured in mainly two parts. Uh, today we're going to explore just the idea and impact of copy number aberrations in cancer. We're going to talk about genomic instability, um, cancer evolution, and genetic heterogeneity. Uh, tumor suppressors versus oncogenes, what are actionable mutations, so the things that we hope that this knowledge of inferring copy, copy number aberrations are going to transfer to the clinic, for instance. Uh, and then in the second part of the talk, we're, we're going to talk uh, more practically about detecting copy number aberrations, what are some confounding factors and strategies to overcome these, um, and how to measure, uh, measure copy number aberrations, and what are some of the computational tools uh, that are typically used and some of the tools that you guys will use in the lab. Uh, so I think between these two sections, we'll have, we should have a small break. Uh, so uh, that will be another time and opportunity to ask questions. Okay, so uh, you've heard in Trevor's talk that cancer is a disease of the genome, and tumorogenesis is this really multi-step process that requires uh, several mutations in order to get a cancer going. So here in this, in this diagram, uh, we see some normal cells here on the very left. Um, and some of these cells will have somatic mutations. And the right mutations will cause a selective advantage in some cells. So either they are less likely to die or they're more likely to proliferate uh, at an increased rate. And so when a mutation confers this highly advantageous phenotype, uh, these cells outcompete their neighbors. Um, and each time they divide, they can get additional mutations. Okay, so when, um, and so when these additional mutations are um, uh, acquired, as you can see here by the different colors, although this green is a little bit hard to see, so this green, this pink, this orange lineages um, are characterized by mutations in these particular genes. Um, so these selective pressures um, will cause a big increase in the population frequency of these cells. Uh, and then under se a selective pressure, for instance, during treatment, you can see really big reorganization of the clonal structure of these tumors. So here, we, as we go along to the right, uh, time is passing. So you can see here that chemotherapy starts. So this tumor is starting to be treated. And so there's probably surgical resection of this tumor mass and then chemotherapy, which puts a huge selective pressure on these uh, clones. And what survives and comes back as a recurrent tumor isn't necessarily those genetic clones that were very successful in the primary tumor. So this green line lineage is completely gone, um, and this red lineage, which was not really advantageous in the primary tumor, now makes up the majority of cells. And then we also see acquired uh, subsequent mutations in the recurrence, like that blue clone. Um, so uh, these malignant cells, even within a single tumor, can differ from each other. Uh, both in space, so at the same time, in different parts of the tumors, you can see different genotypes, uh, and they certainly uh, evolve over time. Uh, and very rarely is a tumor 100% pure, right? So often, tumor samples will contain infiltrating cells, uh, like immune cells, as well as various types of cells from the uh, microenvironment. So essentially, this makes tumors complex, like a normal tissue. Um, and so we see stromal cells and their presence and composition um, uh, actually can significantly change the biology of the tumor. And so it, it could make a tumor more or less sensitive to chemotherapy. So, the, um, so actually the combination of genetically distinct clones in a tumor, as well as the specific uh, types of uh, microenvironment, 
or cells in the microenvironment are, are um, what are involved in the pathogenesis of some and perhaps all cancers. So it's important to appreciate this, uh, this aspect of tumor biology. Uh, and you guys have seen this before. Our foundation for understanding biology of cancers is really easily presented as the set of six hallmarks. Uh, so these are the acquired functional capabilities that enable cancer cells to survive, to proliferate, to disseminate to other parts of the body. And the acquisition of these capabilities um, is made possible by two enabling characteristics. So these are shown here uh, on the bottom right. So inflammation and the tumor microenvironment, like I was saying, and most relevant to our discussion today, uh, genome instability and mutation. So genomic instability is what endows cancer cells uh, with the genetic alterations that can drive tumor, tumor progression. So understanding tumor biology is then an exercise in measuring or detecting these clonal genotypes. Um, so these are shown here by the different colors of these cells, um, and linking these then to uh, disease progression and response to treatment. Um, so one way to infer clonal lineages is to consider their population frequency in the tumor. However, there are several confounding factors to consider. And uh, today we're going to talk uh, in a little bit of detail about two of them. One is normal contamination, like I mentioned. Uh, these are non-malignant cells from the tumor stroma. Uh, and the simultaneous presence of these multiple genetically distinct lineages uh, whose relative frequencies need to be deconvoluted. OK, so before delving into the details of how we're going to do that, uh, let's go over some background on copy number alterations. Uh, and we can start by considering this karyotype of a normal human cell. Uh, so this is a spectrokaryogram with chromosome painting, which makes each chromosome in the human genome have a distinct color. So it makes it easy to appreciate that the structure of the human genome is deployed. So we have two copies uh, of each chromosome, one from the, our moms and one from our dads, uh, except for the X and Y chromosome. Uh, and these are some genomes from ovarian carcinomas, which are uh, uh, it's a cancer that has some of the highest burden of copy number aberrations. Um, and so their genomes look almost nothing like the normal karyotype we saw, right? It's obvious from these images that copy number changes are a major feature of cancer. Um, so it makes sense to study uh, copy number profiles in detail to get insight into the biology of these diseases. And actually, the biology of ovarian carcinomas is driven by copy number events. So these types of um, uh, karyotypes are really laborious to produce, but they're really interesting, and, they, and I wanted to show this because they reveal a couple of, of features of copy number aberrations that we should keep in mind as we keep going. One is, it's really obvious uh, here um, when translocations between chromosomes happen, because you'll see different colors linked together in the same physical DNA molecule. Um, second, it's obvious these are not diploid genomes, right? Most of these chromosomes are found at copy numbers of three or four or six or even more. So that means that at some point in the evolution of these tumors, at least one round of whole genome duplication occurred. So that's exactly what it sounds like. You have the genome, you have duplication of the genome before that cell splits into two cells, but you don't have adequate uh, segregation of chromosomes. So all of that DNA ends up being uh, segregated to one cell. And so this is a fairly prevalent feature in cancer. Um, and having a genome duplication event is really associated with the um, propagation of chromosomal instability. So in many tumors, these genome duplic duplication events happen early, um, and they essentially provide the material for major chaotic reorganization of the, of the tumor genome. And then finally, I wanted to point out that it, this resolution, it's really obvious what the broad events are, uh, ones that encompass whole chromosome arms, but actually there are lots of focal events in cancer, and so we're going to talk about those uh, in more detail in a little bit. Okay, so here are some examples of the type of copy number events that we would try to detect. Um, you can see here a normal chromosome. This region of the chromosome has three loci, A, B, C. Um, and we can look for deletions, right, where A is now next to C because B is deleted, uh, where we have insertion of another um, portion of the genome, D. Um, we can look for inversions, where we have CBA instead of ABC, or we can look for copy number variations, where we see um, multiple copies of a particular locus, or even segmental duplications, which tend to be bigger. 
And so just a note on, on nomenclatures uh, is that CNVs, what this, which is what this is, these are variations or polymorphisms present in the general population. So we all have these variants. Uh, if we compare our genomes, there will be lots of these kinds of events that are different between any two normal people. Um, CNAs, or copy number um, aberrations or alterations, are somatic changes that are present in tumor genomes, but not the germline. So we can see that up here, right? So, um, so these are amplifications or deletions that typically will range between uh, 1 kb to a whole chromosome arm, um, where deletions, of course, will have a loss of DNA content and bring two two parts of the genome that were previously distal in close contact. Um, and of course, amplifications uh, involve multiple copies, uh, not just two, that would be a duplication. Amplifications would be typically like four or five or more copies of, of a particular region. Uh, so these, these types of somatic rearrangements are a hallmark of tumor genomes. So loss of key tumor suppressor genes like BRCA or P53, uh, these have a significant impact on the biology of a cell. And amplifications of growth factors or proliferative genes like PI3K or, um, or B2 can promote proliferation. So there's actually been a huge amount of effort to profile cancer genomes and find copy number aberrations that are diagnostic or prognostic. Um, and some of these have become, sorry, some of these have become um, targets for therapy. So that's really the goal of this whole exercise. Um, so just conceptually, um, how do we find amplifications, deletions, and so on and so forth? Um, and the concept I want to bring up here is uh, heterozygosity and how heterozygosity is used to infer copy number events. And so our genomes are actually peppered throughout with um, natural, like positions that will naturally vary between individuals, right? So these are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Um, we have about 10 million SNPs. Um, and for ease of nomenclature, the two alleles uh, that are the most common in the human population are denoted A and B. So here we see, in the case of no copy number aberration or variants, um, these particular positions um, have a particular, uh, these three positions have a particular genotype. So AA, AB, and BB. When we have a duplication, we can see a change in that genotype. So if we duplicate the AB locus, um, actually, we have, we go from double A to triple A. Uh, we maintain BB, but now we add um, a second B. So we've added a second B and a second A. A hemizygous deletion where you just have deletion of one copy would take us from AA to a single A and from AB to a single A because we've deleted this B allele here. Uh, and when we have a homozygous deletion, we just don't see any evidence for these two alleles. So this is kind of this idea that the two alleles more, most common in the human population that are denoted A and B is initially very confusing for many people. And I wanted to draw on the board um, the thing that I usually draw when people come and ask me about this afterwards. Uh, but we don't have a board here, so I made an, an extra slide that you guys don't have uh, in order to explain this well. Okay, so um, this is a normal genome. You get one copy of your DNA from your mom and one copy from your dad. And almost all the positions are going to be the same, but we're just going to look at four of them um, for, for reference. So we have three billion uh, bases, right? And they're going to be 10 million SNPs. Um, so I've highlighted four, one which is a heterozygous SNP, right? An A from the mom, a C from the dad, a homozygous SNP where you get the same allele from both parents, uh, another heterozygous SNP, and another homozygous SNP. So in the population, these alleles are associated with a specific frequency. So 80% of people, if you're going to profile hundreds or thousands of people, are going to have an A. So that's the A allele. 20% of people will have a C, so that's the B allele. So back in the previous slide, all, the, all this A and B stuff is actually this. So the minor allele is always called B. The major allele in the population of people is called A. So this CC position, um, most people, 60% would have an A. So the A allele is not present. 
this this site ha has the C, which is the B allele. And similarly here, we see uh, an AB where uh, where now the G is the majority um, is the major alleles, and so we set that one to A. And similarly here, we can we can uh, see which one is A and B based on uh, population frequencies. So now when we translate this back into a B allele frequencies for our particular individual, we can see that this position is, the B allele frequency is 50%. Um, at this position, because the B allele is the C and this person only has a C, the beta allele frequency is one. Um, here again, we see a heterozygous SNP, and here we see only the A allele present. And so the B allele frequency is zero. And when we plot this on a graph where along the X chromosome, we're going to have all the variants we're going to detect in the genome, but I'm only showing you points for these particular four. And we plot the beta allele frequency. Uh, we're going to see a 0.5 here, a 1 here, a 0.5 here, and a 0 here. So keep this in mind, or maybe draw a little diagram of this, because this is really useful for interpreting the plots that are going to come up. So I'll show you the next plot in a second. But does this kind of make sense? We're using the population frequencies to, instead of saying A, C, 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 T, G, da, 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 like whatever the combination is of these four uh, nucleotides, we're just going to call them A and B. So it's a way to simplify the data. And the reason to do that is to generate these kinds of plots where I've hidden a bunch of things that I think you have printed out on your, uh, on your slides. Um, so the whole goal of this exercise is to go through the genome, and here we see one chromosome, so you can see the ideogram here on the bottom. And each one of these points is, um, on, in the bottom plot, represents the copy number at that locus, and on the top plot is this beta allele frequency plot, this B allele frequency. So you can see here, for most of the chromosome, you have lots of points around 0.5, so these are heterozygous SNPs. You have a bunch of stuff here up at 1, so these where they're homozygous for the major allele, uh, and a bunch of stuff here at 0, where they're hom these positions are homozygous for the um, A allele, so the B alleles at 0. And then seeing deviations from these three bands indicates that something funny is happening. And so that's the pattern to look for, and then there are specific patterns that we're going to talk about that would indicate what is happening in terms of copy number and heterozygosity. And then this graph at the bottom basically um, tells us that the copy number, um, so this is the log R ratio of um, how much coverage you have or the copy number in your tumor versus your normal. So if the difference is, so if, if you have a diploid tumor and a diploid normal, the difference is going to be zero. So if this thing is around zero, like we see for most of the chromosome here, then there's no major copy number event. Uh, but just here, just after the uh, centromere, we see higher copy numbers. So there's been a copy number gain. Or actually, a no there, there have been two copy number gains. Okay, so uh, we've gone over this, what you know, the band pattern in a normal uh, scenario. Um, we can also see cases where there are, where there's a copy neutral event. So the copy number doesn't change, but this pattern changes. So we've lost heterozygosity. So I don't know how many of you guys have uh, heard the concept of copy neutral LOH. Show of hands, maybe. Yeah, a few of you. So there are definitely, this is kind of a typical pattern for tumor suppressors. Um, we'll go over it in the next slide. Uh, but you have to have this beta allele frequency in order to pick up these kinds of events. Um, when you have three copies, that changes your beta allele frequency because you no longer have one out of two. Now you're gonna, your beta allele is gonna either be uh, one out of three or two out of three or completely gone or all three copies will be the B allele. So then you start to see this banding pattern where you have, you don't have anything at 0.5, you now have uh, one out of three and two out of three, right? So 0.33 and 0.66, these are always symmetrical. Um, and if you have four copies, you see an additional band, right, where you, you regain this heterozygosity because you can have two A alleles, two B alleles, or three A alleles and one B allele, or one A allele and three B alleles, and so on and so forth. So this changing pattern of bands tells you, is kind of correlated with um, the, the copies of DNA that, you've, uh, that you have. And you can see that down here in the copy number plot as well. Um, what copy number by itself won't tell you is about these copy-neutral loss of heterozygosity events. So these happen 
essentially, this is kind of a, a classic way to take out a tumor suppressor gene. And so you have a heterozygous position, or let's say you have, uh, in the case of a tumor suppressor gene, you would have a mutation, for instance, in uh, PATCH or SUFU. Um, and then when your cell duplicates its DNA and divides, there is a non-disjunction event. So you, you segregate two, co two of the same copies with a mutation in one cell and then lose the wild type. So now you have a copy neutral uh, event where that region is homozygous because it's actually the same chromosome twice. <clears throat> so here's an extremely clean and beautiful example of a tumor that has um, a number of different types of events going on. Um, and these are colored to indicate um, discrete regions of distinct copy number states. So on top we can see the copy number profile. In blue are all the regions that are diploid. So these are going to have uh, two copies of the chromosome. Um, so these are a zero on the Y scale. And then a single copy gain will show up uh, at the beginning and that corresponds to um, a shift here in the uh, BAF plot uh, from 0.5. So here the gray indicates that we have heterozygosity, and here we have a shift away from heterozygosity because now we have an extra copy. Um, a loss is um, the section in green. Do you guys see green or black? Green. Yeah. So you can see that um, you also have a shift away from heterozygosity. And here we have another example of copy neutral loss of heterozygosity where you see two copies of the genome, but absolutely. Uh, a complete lack of heterozygosity. And we also see a homozygous deletion where, um, um, where this small region is completely lost. Okay, so let's look at a couple of quick examples of copy number aberrations involving driver genes that we know are important in cancer. This is um, amplification of a potent oncogene, uh, ERB2, on chromosome 17 of a breast cancer patient. Uh, so the x-axis, again, is the uh, position along the chromosome, and the y-axis is the copy number as a function of the normal genome in this in individual. So the expectation is that there are two copies of the reference, um, and in the genome encoding ERB2, this very red signal indicates that there are actually many copies of the gene. So you can see the median copy number is around five or maybe even six at this locus. Uh, so ERB2 is actually amplified in this way in about 15% of all breast cancers. And it's a driver event that leads to proliferation and growth uh, of tumor cells. And patients that have this high level amplification uh, can be treated with a drug called Herceptin. So they respond really well. So that's a great example of personalized or precision medicine. So knowing the, the driver event in a tumor will let you then uh, make relatively rational predictions for a treatment. Uh, and in clinical practice, a technique that's often used to kind of validate or prove that uh, an event is happening is uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization. Uh, so this is a fluorescent sequence specific, so it's a sequence specific probe uh, that's fluorescently tagged, and it ca you can use it to label the genomic content of cells. So the blue areas here are the nucleus, and the green probe in this case, you can see these little green dots, hopefully, uh, those are... Um, those are uh, recognizing some sequence that we know is diploid in these tumors, and the red probe corresponds to ERB2. So you can see that some cells have literally hundreds uh, of copies of this gene. So this FISH assay is clinically approved, um, and it's an alternative way to measure, um, um, an, an alternative way to, to FISH, which is clinically approved, is to actually measure the level of the, of the protein through immunohistochemistry. Uh, so that's often done as well. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have um, complete losses of tumor suppressor genes. So this is what a deletion looks like. I circled this event because it's so tiny. Uh, this is a really focal deletion of uh, the tumor suppressor P10. Um, and often tumor suppressor, suppressors that need to be homozygously deleted or completely lost will have these very, very focal uh, small regions of loss. Okay, so we have these gains and losses. Um, the clinically relevant subset of these alterations are, that are functional are going to give rise to uh, gene expression changes. So this is the, certainly the case for ERB2. So here on the right, we were seeing a, a plot of the expression level. Um, and then the colors indicate the copy number state 
so with red being a high level of amplification. And you can see that there's, there's definitely a relationship between copy number and expression for this gene. Um, and in general, um, as a rule, there's a much better correlation of with expression for focal events compared to broad events. And so here we see, um, we, we see high amplitude gains and losses versus broad gains and losses. And the difference in gene expression as a function of whether um, the high amplitude gains or losses are homozygous deletions or balanced um, in copy number or high level amplification. So you can see that the, um, the focal events actually drive gene expression changes to a much, uh, uh, to a much higher degree. And that's because gene expression, you know, it's sensitive to copy number, but also other, many other regulatory events, right? So how much, how many transcription factors bind to that locus and their regulation, um, et cetera. However, why, why do you think that we're all genes? Because, I mean, there are some genes in this area. The yes. So they are affected, but not to the level that you would see for like ERB2 amplification. Mm -hmm. So that focal event would generate in some cells, you know, there are 10 copies or more. So that will be much more detectable as a gene expression change uh, than gaining, you're going from two copies to three, right. which might have a small effect in, in gene expression change, but then you might have, you know, down regulation of some transcription factors to correct for this. So there's a lot of um, regulatory inputs for expression uh, of genes. And um, I mean, the... So it's because of the number of copies, so the number of copies that you get in the, yeah. in the broad ones is... Is the usually number. one more or one less, right? And the focal events will usually delete two copies of a tumor suppressor gene, right? So then you start to see this uh, on the left, right? These homozygous deletions affecting gene expression and having it go significantly down. And then conversely, these amplifications really driving gene expression up. So uh, there are a number of genes that are known to be affected uh, by copy number, like recurrent copy number aberrations uh, in many cancers, especially these high level gains and homozygous deletions. Um, and we see certain genes coming up as targets across a number of ca cancers. Uh, so these correspond to the known oncogenes that drive proliferation, or B2, EGFR, and so on, uh, and known tumor suppressor genes like P10, BRCA1, and 2, uh, which we'll talk about in a second in a little bit more detail. Um, and so identifying the full repertoire of these driver events in cancer, especially the more rarely mutated genes, which are harder to find, uh, takes large cohorts of patients uh, across cancer types. So this is just a very short, um, now uh, uh, in a bit of need of updating, list of papers that describe the efforts of big international consortia uh, to look at large cohorts of patients um, that have copy number changes, measured either with genotyping arrays um, or with whole exome or whole genome sequencing approaches. Um, and of course, the ultimate goal of all this activity in profiling cancer genomes is to find actionable targets. And so these are genes or pathways uh, that cancers rely on to proliferate um, and then develop therapeutic agents against those targets. Um, so this is a brief list of specific actionable copy number changes in cancers that can be uh, targeted. So I think it's pretty clear that amplifications or gain of functions are much more feasible to target um, uh, with small molecule drugs that will inhibit the action of a protein than uh, tumor suppressors because you can't, it's very hard to add back functionality. It's very easy to just mess, the, mess up the way something works. Um, and so in addition to guiding treatment, you know, these genomes can, can actually be used to stratify patients. So this is a nice synthesis uh, study that shows um, that cancers actually reside on a spectrum where at one end tumors uh, harbor a lot of point mutations. So that's shown here on the left. And at the other end, like for the ovarian carcinomas, um, uh, which we saw the karyotypes for, uh, they harbor a lot of copy number alterations. And so it seems that there is either a selection for processes that promote defects in DNA repair um, that fixes double strand breaks and thus lead to genomic instability, or selection for processes that lead to a deficiency in mismatch repair uh, that repairs single base changes. 
And so we see cancers falling on kind of the ends of these two spectrums. So the, the presence of both DNA repair mechanisms being altered is very, very rare and likely selected against. So we don't really see anything in this middle space. Um, so, so yes, most cancers reside mostly at the ends of these scales. Um, and that actually, actually stratifying patients in this way uh, opens up a therapeutic opportunity because drugs have been specifically developed to interfere which e with each of these acquired capabilities necessary for tumor growth and progression that, um, uh, that you've heard about already. And many of these drugs are already in clinical trials um, and in some cases are already approved for clinical use. And we can just take a quick look um, at one of the genomic instability drugs uh, um, or a category of drugs, which are the PARP inhibitors. So this is a class of drugs targeting genomic instability. And the key idea, idea here is that DNA is damaged thousands of times during each cell cycle. So that damage has to be ongoingly repaired in order uh, for each of your normal cells to proceed through the cell cycle. So PARP1 is the protein that's important for repairing single-strand breaks. So these are NICs in DNA. Uh, if these NICs persist unrepaired uh, until DNA is replicated, then the replication process itself can cause double-stranded breaks at those positions. And so drugs that inhibit PARP1 will cause multiple double-strand breaks uh, to form in this way. Uh, so normal healthy cells survive uh, inhibition of PARP because they have intact BRCA1 and 2 proteins that are involved in the repair of double-stranded breaks. Um, and, and that's done through the homologous recombination repair pathway. Uh, but in the subset of tumors where these genes are mutated, like breast cancer, which are BRCA1 and 2 mutated, double-stranded breaks cannot be uh, efficiently repaired. So they accumulate in increasing numbers and lead to the, cell, to the death of these cells. Um, so these two events, BRCA1 mutations and PARP inhibition, are considered synthetically lethal to one another. Um, so each, each individual event can be tolerated, uh, but together they cause cell death. So this drug won't affect your normal cells because your normal cells have a working copy of BRCA1, uh, but they will selectively kill the breast cancer cells with, uh, with these mutations. And actually, um, so, so this opens up, in a way, um, a way to target tumor suppressor genes, right, which are very difficult to target with small molecule drugs. Um, and so we can take advantage of this synthetic lethal combination uh, to come up with, with better therapies. Um, so there are currently two drugs available clinically um, approved for BRCA mutant breast cancers. So women can have a, you know, a test for the, uh, for the uh, uh, presence of BRCA mutations. Um, and these drugs are approved, but there are others as well in clinical trials. So this is a great example of how stratifying patients can lead to, um, to better approaches to therapy. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move on to talking about some confounding factors uh, for, or that make copy number uh, inference challenging. Um, and essentially, the challenge is, is, comes from three main, uh, three, there are three main reasons. Uh, first of all, when you're profiling a sample, um, as I mentioned, cancer cells are almost always intermixed with some normal cells. Okay, so we have, uh, we can have low purity in some cases, and that's going to uh, confound our analysis. Um, second, the actual DNA content of cells, uh, the ploidy, is unknown. So you don't know if you have a diploid uh, tumor or a tetraploid tumor and so on. And then third, the cancer cell population could be heterogeneous because of this clonal evolution process where you gain and lose things as a function of time, and only some cells will have uh, specific events. And so when these values are unknown and have to be predicted, um, there's often more than one combination of purity and ploidy that can explain an observed copy number state. Um, so for instance, so this is called the identifiability problem. So um, let's say that we have um, a homozygous deletion in a sample with 30% purity. The way that you would um, calculate the copy number is you would take the contribution of DNA from your normal cells, so these are diploid, so that particular locus, let's say we're looking at P10, um, has two copies in 60% um, of cells, because 60% of cells are normal. And then in the 30% of cells that are part of your tumor, you see zero copies. And so when you 
add these two things together, you get an overall copy number in your sample of 1.2 instead of 2. So you know there's been a deletion, but you don't see uh, that there's been a homozygous deletion. You can also get 1.2 in a heterozygous uh, deletion case in a tumor with 60% purity. So in this case, you have two copies coming from 30% 30, 30 of cells and one copy coming from 60% of cells. So you have the same copy number. Um, uh, you have the same measured copy number, but two ways in which it could have happened. Um, you could also have an equivalent um, beta allele frequency. For instance, in a case where you have a copy number gain in a diploid tumor, so you go from AB to AAB, or you could have a copy number loss in a tetraploid tumor, so you go from AABB to AAB. So there's this identifiability problem and this purity and ploidy and subclonal events that kind of add... Uh, um, that make this inference more difficult. Yes, what was the question? How do you normally measure purity? So you have, I mean, I guess a way to measure it is to measure how many cells have you, you know, below the tumors and how many you look normal. But like in large scale, if you have many samples and this kind of stuff, how do you normally do um, So, I mean, one way is I'm going to be on the next slide, which is to infer the best fit of the of copy number. Uh, ploidy and purity. Um, I think there are also ways to measure purity kind of in vitro to validate your prediction, uh, but I don't have expertise of that. Do you guys in the back? How would you measure how many cells have you in the tumor? Like in Yeah. So there is there is some. Yeah. What your what your purity is. Yeah. So for some of these methods that try to infer purity, the gold standard they compare to are some of the samples in TCGA, right? The the Cancer Genome Atlas, which has sequenced thousands and thousands of tumors. And for some of them, pathology slides exist. And, uh, you know, a review has been done to kind of determine in, in those samples what the, the purity was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so it's definitely a, a difficult problem. This is one of the approaches. Um, this is a computa computational tool, and you know most of the tools that are going to predict purity are computational tools. Um, it's if you have a pathologist handy, then you could do a bit more to confirm your predictions. Um, but this is the absolute algorithm. So this takes in processed copy number segments like we were seeing uh, with the BAF and copy number plots from before. Um, so the loss of heterozygosity and uh, inferred amplifications and deletions. And then it tries to infer the best combination of purity and ploidy. Uh, so that's this graph here on the bottom left. Uh, that would explain um, the particular, uh, you know, amount of, of gains and losses in LOH in that, in that individual sample. And so... Um, I mean, I, I could go through this whole thing, but it's a published paper, and this is a method that you could, you guys, I think we're using Absolute in the, is that right, Hamza? Are we using Absolute in the lab? Uh, we're using Onto SSS. Okay. Onto SSS. 
Um, so it's a paper you could you guys could read, or we could go um, in more detail about, uh, on these plots if you guys want um, afterwards. But the whole point is that it it basically has a model to try to fit purity and ploidy and come up with a with a prediction. Um, and in cases where different combinations of purity and ploidy are equally likely, then it picks the most uh, then it picks one based on um, um, information from a database of what's normally seen in cancer. So it's more common to see a tetraploid tumor than to see a tumor with seven copies. And so if you have an equal choice between your tumor being tetraploid or uh, having seven copies, you will have slightly more chance of it being called tetraploid. And so taking this approach and looking at purity and ploidy across 5,000 cancers, uh, it turns out that over a third of all cancers have a ploidy of three or greater. Uh, meaning that they must have undergone this genome doubling event at some point in their evolutionary history. Um, and so we see this for multiple types of cancers. The different kinds are here on the bottom. Uh, ploidy is on the left, and here's kind of a cumulative distribution. So you can see there's a peak at two where most tumors are deployed, but also a significant peak um, around three or, and just under four. Uh, and so can anyone tell me why it's not actually four? What do you guys think? Why don't we see four? Hmm? Well, this is after uh, inferring purity. So it could be normal contamination if your purity estimate isn't quite right. But usually it's because um, when you do have a genome duplication event, then you have lots of other rearrangements that happen. And in many cases, those are deletions. So your tumor duplicates its genome, and then all sorts of events happen, including massive losses, because you have plenty of DNA to, uh, that's extra, so you can afford to lose a lot. So you see a lot of losses in these tetraploid genomes, and that's why the overall copy number goes down to, uh, to three point something. So you won't typically see four. Um, yeah? So the point is that kind of like an average of all chromosomes, so if you have yeah. a tetraploid, but you lose some? Yes. Okay. So you would go from AABB, to AAB or ABB, right? You would lose if you lose one copy, but you yeah, could lose two copies. That's why it's not a whole yes, number. it's a whole. It's an average over the whole genome. Yeah. Um, and then this, these graphs basically show that um, there's compelling evidence that this genome uh, doubling event happens early. So what we see here for broad events on top and focal events on the bottom, um, with gains in reds. Uh, and losses in blue is that in samples which have a whole genome duplication event, uh, so every pair of these bars are the diploid versus the duplicated um, genomes, uh, there are many more amplifications and deletions that occur after the genome duplication. So these genome duplication bars are a lot higher, and specifically the, the deletions are a lot higher, right? So many more losses happen after genome duplication. Um, Right, so more CNAs occur after genome duplication than before, and deletions are outnumber gains. Uh, and so just one final example um, for this section uh, of the clinical relevance of genome doubling events in cancer is, is from this recently published cohort of 100 lung cancers where each patient's tumor was uh, genomically profiled using exome sequencing, um, but from using multiple spatially uh, separate samples of the primary untreated tumor. So each tumor has you know, three or more um, individual pieces. And so this is the conceptual design of this experiment where uh, you would do copy number loss, uh, copy number analysis and mutation calling for each region. And then you use that information to work out the phylogeny of events that uh, generated this tumor. So at the bottom here, you would have the normal cells that um, then acquire mutations. And that clone that has all of these mutations um, grew. And then a portion of those cells um, um, acquired some mutations or copy number aberrations that are specific to the subset of cells. So these are subclonal. Um, and so you have this d diversification, and you can infer these phylogenies from multi regional samples uh, or from single cell samples of, of tumors. Um, and so in this paper, they show, and I'm just going to highlight a, a couple of findings that are relevant to our discussion. So they they found that nearly 50% of copy number alterations were subclonal and restricted to a single part of the tumor. 
So if you're just bi biopsying one piece and sequencing that, and you're seeing an event, it's very likely, well, it's 50, you have a 50% chance in this kind of tumor that it's actually just a, a regional event and, and it's not uh, one of those um, trunk events. Um, so 70% of these subclonal events look clonal because we don't know that they're in all cells. Uh, we don't know that they're not, not in all cells. So it's important to do this multi-regional sampling or keep in mind this idea that there is clonal evolution. Um, early genome doubling events were highly associated with the presence of subclonal events, right? So that's the idea that this really propagates genomic instability. So every cell is going to have a chance for something else happening. Um, and you see lots of these subclonal events. And here on the right, we see this uh, survival plot. Uh, where you can appreciate that those patients with lots of subclonal heterogeneity actually do a lot worse in terms of disease outcome uh, compared to those patients that have a more bland genome. So it's a clinically relevant aspect of, of the biology of these tumors. Um, <clears throat> so it's also possible to classify mutations in genes by the timing of their mutation into those that happen early in tumorigenesis, uh, so pre-genome doubling, so these are going to be events that are involved in tumor initiation um, and those that are subclonal and occur later. And so these likely have a part in tumor maintenance uh, or even resistance to therapy. Um, so if you're thinking of uh, trying to find druggable genes in a disease, then the idea would be to focus on these events that are going to be present in every cell rather than these um, events that are going to be present in only a subset of cells. So. I recommend reading this paper. It's full of interesting facts that are uh, relevant to our concepts. Um, and so it, it's a good thing to read if you get a chance. But basically, um, that kind of concludes the first part of the talk. And now there's going to be a more detailed uh, second part of the talk. I just want to take maybe five minutes break. Uh, if there are any questions, we can chat about things. Um, otherwise, we will, I don't know, Anne, if you want to pause this for five minutes. Okay. I mean, you can hear it. Yeah. How's this volume? Is it any better? Is it about the same? Yeah, I really can't hear. Okay. Yeah. That wasn't any better? Apparently not. Like, how close do I have to get? <laughs> like I, it kind of works, but is this any better? No, I can't hear anything. The stereo versus mono. I was like, I don't want to mess with it too much either. Time to take the wind sock off. <laughs> the mic sock? He didn't know. Okay. Hmm. So what would change with between what do you next? Turned off some something in the background. Okay. Um, so I
Okay, guys, I think we should get going. Um, yeah? I will speak up. Is this a little bit better? Great. Okay, so um, measuring measurement technologies for copy number analysis. Uh, there's been a progression uh, of these technologies uh, over a number of years, um, ranging from these low-resolution, high-accuracy approaches like FISH, which we mentioned, uh, to this middle ground of um, 
higher resolution, um, but still lower accuracy and coming uh, to the current date with these high resolution and higher ac accuracy methods like uh, whole genome sequencing. Um, so this is the fish is this method where we can look at the actual copy number at just a few loci sim sim simultaneously uh, in single cells. Um, and then in the early 2000s, these hybridization array platforms were developed um, that were capable of probing between 30 to 100,000 positions in a genome. Uh, and so one could wash total DNA over this uh, array and generate intensity signals that corresponded to the copy number state, uh, but no um, LOH calls, so no beta, no beta allele frequencies. And then in the mid-2000s uh, was, was the advent of these very high-density uh, genotype arrays that came on the market, uh, mostly from Illumina and AFI. And these really drove analysis of copy number in cancer for many years. Um, so large cohorts of many types of cancers have been generated uh, on these platforms, for instance, from the TCGA. And at the moment, uh, the large consortia and many labs have moved into whole genome or exome sequencing data. So we're going to take a look at both um, array and genomic data, and genomic data analysis um, in the next few slides and also in the lab. Uh, so just to remind us, uh, the challenges that have to be overcome in order to accurately measure copy number changes is that cancer is a mixture of normal cells, um, the tumor and the microenvironment, um, and these dilute essentially the signals of gain and loss uh, because the normal cells have a normal diploid genome. Uh, so that alters our sensitivity. There's also this intratumoral heterogeneity uh, where we have copy number profiles in just subsets of cells. Uh, so this creates a lot of biological noise when we try to infer signals. So deconvoluting these mixtures of cells is an important part of analysis. Uh, and then finally, the other confounding factor is we're looking for somatic events in the presence of germline alterations. So germline events are going to be the strongest signals we see because they're present in every single cell. Um, and we have the problem of polyploidy. So um, all the calls we make are actually relative to a diploid copy number uh, in the germline. And the original algorithms uh, that were devised for analyzing microarray data uh, were designed for population studies, where people were looking for differences in germline copy number events and heterozygosity between uh, normal individuals in, in different populations, for instances. And so when these algorithms were applied to cancer data, it became obvious they were not very well suited uh, to uh, dealing with all these sources of biological variation. And so in the last few years, there's been a tremendous advance in, in the computational approaches uh, to interpret these copy number signals. Uh, this is just a good review from Terry Speed, the godfather of bioinformatics, that describes the statistical considerations in cancer genomics data. Uh, so it's a good read in general uh, for the problem at hand. Um, and so we've talked about these total copy number um, calling and genotypes. And this is just to remind us of the scenario where a single copy duplication leads to a shift in genotype uh, from AB to a AB uh, or ABB. Uh, and a deletion shifts AB to just A, or nothing in the case of homozygous deletions. So we have these changes in genotype. Oops. Um, <clears throat> so when we have two copies of the genome, there are these three possible genotypes, right? Homozygous, heterozygous, or homozygous for the other allele. Um, in the case where we have um, uh, a copy number gain, we can now denote three alleles. So we would have AAA, AAB, ABB, BBB, and so on and so forth when we have four copies or five copies. So this type of table will summarize um, the types of, of genotypes that you would see um, uh, at different kinds of copy number events. Um, oh, there was one more thing I wanted to say. Um, so it's not just the copy number, but this actually also tell, tells us about the um, uh, whether the tumor has a balanced zygosity or a complete loss of one allele in favor of the other. Uh, so, so having that beta allele frequency is really important. Okay, so inferring this beta allele frequencies, both for array data and sequencing data, relies on measuring the relative frequencies of A and B alleles um, at polymorphic positions in the genome. So these are SNPs. Uh, and you guys, I don't know how many of you guys have used dbSNP. Well, you've probably all heard of dbSNP. Um, so dbSNP is a database that warehouses this information. Uh, in the latest version, it has a set of 130 million SNPs. 
uh, that have a known frequency in the general population. So these are useful for this type of work. And we see here some examples of SNPs in the BRCA2 gene, uh, which has over 8,000 variations annotated along its length. Um, a lot of these are non-coding and would occur, occur in the UTRs or introns, uh, but in all cases the two alleles are listed, so you can see that here in this third column, uh, along with their known frequency in the population. So for instance, uh, in this case, the C is the minor allele. Um, Yeah, the C is the minor allele, and it's, oops, and it's found in 0.009% of the general population. So the T is the major allele. So the T would be the A allele, and the C would be the B allele. Um, this wouldn't be a great example of an allele to include on a genotyping array, because most people are not going to have this variant. Uh, the second variant is a good example of one that you would want to include on a genotyping array, because 30% of people will have the T, and the other percent of people will have the G. So... These are informative heterozygous SNPs. Um, and so the AFI SNP6 arrays were designed to measure the presence of SNPs that have this evidence for heterozygosity in the general population. Um, essentially, it consists of probes that are 25 base pairs long. They're oligonucleotides, which contain the polymorphism in the middle. Um, there are 900,000 probes uh, that are essentially in genomic regions uh, uh, known to have SNPs, as well as over 900,000 probes that are known to uh, be in genomic regions which vary in copy number, uh, but don't necessarily have polymorphisms. So these probes hybridize with label DNA and generate kind of a continuous signal of intensity that corresponds to the amount of DNA at that locus in the library. So the more copies of DNA you have, the brighter the signal of binding uh, to that specific oligoprobe. And so because we know the positions of the probes on the genome, we can plot the intensities of the probes on the chromosome plots uh, as dots, as we've seen. And by the way, a, a good question came up uh, in the five minutes, which was that when we look at those B allele plots and we have the three bands, um, you know, it's easy to assume that any, any position you see three bands, but actually each dot is an independent point along the genome. So, you know, at a certain position, you're going to have a 1 in your B allele frequency, and then a few bases later, you'll have a 0. And a few bases later, you might have a 0.5. And because there's noise in all this data, you have that fuzziness to the bands. Uh, but you never have a position at which you see multiple of these values. Um, so here, this describes um, what actually happens on a SNP6 array. So basically, we have this DNA. Um, that has a SNP. So one allele will have an A and one allele will have a C. And the probes uh, that correspond to the SNP are going to have the A and the C. Um, so some will have the A and some will have the C. This is so tiny on mine. Um, it's, do you guys see different colors here? It's this T. Ah. This T, I think it's this a or C would correspond to yeah, T or G. And then uh, when the DNA that has allele A binds, it will bind, so this is the DNA here on the left, and it binds the probe that has a T because it has perfect complementarity. And always this binding, you know, has kinetics. So the DNA and probe stick together and there's some fluorescence signal given off and then they kind of come apart. So you always have some binding, even for non-specific uh, or less specific interactions, you're gonna, always going to have some background with SNP6 arrays. Uh, but you'll have a lot more signal at those bindings that are perfect. So this AT and this GC, which have perfect, perfect bindings, will give a stronger signal. So you always, have, you always have signal for all the different genotypes, but you can tell which ones are uh, the ones with, with more support. So that's sort of the short, short notes version of how this works. Um, so people still run SNP6 arrays. Uh, there's a wealth of, da of data publicly available from these large consortia. Uh, TCGA, for instance, has about 11,000 tumor samples profiled with SNP6 arrays, um, as well as other platforms. So these span a, a range of diseases. So you can see here lung cancer, uh, brain tumors, breast, and so on. Um, and until recently, there was no equivalent for the mouse, uh, but now there is a genotyping array that is able to characterize a wide range of strains in mouse um, and uncover uh, genetic events in mouse models of disease. 
So part of what you're going to do today in the lab is to take uh, genotyping arrays on the Affymetrix SNF6 platform, where we start out with cell files, which are the intent, the, like they contain the intensity values for all of these probes. Um, so that's what comes off the machines. And the workflow is to next pre-process these signals from all the probes on the array so that you end up with normalized and comparable signals across all, the, all your uh, across the whole genome and across all your samples. So some samples may not work very well, some probes may work better than others or be more noisy than others. So this pre-processing step is pretty important. Um, and if you have data and you want to analyze data, this is the time to get all your samples in at once because you want to do this normalization of everything together. If you then bring another cohort because you've sequenced a few more patients, then depending on how many you're bringing in, it's actually worth redoing this whole normalization of the co whole cohort again. Uh, so once you do this, uh, it's followed by a couple of different extraction techniques. Um, on the left, we see generation of calls for copy number and minor allele frequency. Uh, and then those measurements are processed with a statistical model that can infer where the copy number and, and beta allele ratio uh, changes occur, so what the breakpoints are across the genome. And once we have those segments, um, we can project what genes are encoded in the different regions of gain or loss. Um, and we can follow up with, um, like in the other modules that are going to come up in this workshop, uh, with things like pathway analysis or clinical, uh, clinical applications. Uh, so this is the, the workflow for SNF6, but it's really generalizable to ge uh, sequencing data as well. Um, and then for any kind of data, normalization is absolutely required uh, in order to, uh, to uh, remove these platform-induced artifacts. So these probes, like I mentioned, are actually not very specific. They will hybridize with other parts of the genome uh, that they're not intended to, to hybridize with. And that degree of hybridization can be affected by the length of DNA fragments that are washed over the array. Um, and some probes may have worse binding kinetics uh, in the presence of mutations or clusters of SNPs. So if you have multiple mismatches within, uh, within your DNA or your, your probes, that could affect your, your binding. So the, this Aroma Affymetrics package uh, handles a lot of these artifacts uh, so that each experiment is comparable uh, with other experiments and outputs copy number and beta allele frequencies. Um, so hopefully these reflect biology rather than artifacts. So once we've normalized this data and we've removed artifacts, we can start to infer copy number aberrations, loss of heterozygosity regions, um, and allele-specific allele uh, copy number changes. Um, this slide basically lists a number of methods for high-density genotype arrays, including OncoSNP, which is the package that we're going to use in the, in the lab. Um, and it infers purity and ploidy. Um, and, and so, in the copy number field, gen these genotyping arrays were just dominant for many years, and recently whole genome sequencing has been, um, has taken over as being routinely performed uh, because the cost has dropped significantly. So I think currently it costs about $1,400 to do a whole genome, and at 30x coverage, and about $650 or $700 to do a whole exome. Um, so it's much more reasonable than it used to be. And basically in a whole genome experiment, I mean, you've seen one of these kinds of slides before, uh, libraries are essentially made by shearing or fragmenting your DNA into pieces that are relatively uniform, although you always have a distribution. Um, but let's say you, you're aiming for about 300 base pairs, most, most DNA fragments will be in that range. And then you sequence them from both ends, so you sequence 100 base pairs from each side um, of each piece of DNA, so you get these paired end reads, which are these orange bits uh, with the unsequenced portion of the fragment in gray in the middle. Um, and then when you align these read pairs to the genome, hopefully you see obvious patterns uh, when it comes to coverage. Uh, so you can see that, you know, an average amount of cover coverage would be what you would get in the diploid genome. Um, extra coverage is due to copy number gains. Loss of coverage is due to deletions. No coverage is due to homozygous deletions. Um, there are also technical reasons for seeing variations in coverage, which we have to account for. Uh, but basically, um, the sequence reads also give us the allelic ratio at single nucleotide polymorphisms across the genome. So we can infer these copy number events, and we can also uh, infer the beta allele frequencies in an analogous way to, uh, to array data. Uh, but of course, we do this using read counts instead of intensity signals, uh, which can be uh, quite a bit cleaner. Um, so we move from an analog technology with the arrays to a, a digital one, 
uh, so from intensities to counts. Um, so some of the biases in whole genome data, um, often GC content is the predominant contributor to the number of reads that show up at a given locus. So the more GC content you have, which is shown here on the x-axis, um, the more read depth you have. So there's a positive correlation. Um, and so that's one aspect of the data that needs to be corrected for, and regression techniques are uh, typically used to correct that bias. Um, and so here on the right, you see the corrected, uh, the corrected coverage considering GC content. Another source of bias is that the human, the human genome has many, many repetitive sequences, as you've heard already. Um, so some reads cannot be aligned or mapped unambiguously. And when you have multiple alignment options for any given read, depending on the parameters with which you're um, uh, aligning, the aligner will pick one of those three spots that a read might go into. Uh, so this could be a random selection or it could be the first uh, position of alignment, um, depending on the parameters you're using. And so that generates those stacks of reads you guys were seeing before, right? So it's always going to make the same decision out of, a, you know, three possible position. So you'll see those stacks of reads. And so that's actually something we can account for because we know what the repetitive uh, elements are. Um, and so this reaping content it makes this difficult, but, um, uh, but we can correct for it uh, to a large degree. And so the main effect of all this processing is that we, um, we go from a copy number plot that looks kind of like this on the top, which is very fuzzy and messy. Um, we can bin regions of the genome uh, in order to get rid of some of this variability. So if we do, if we bin reads into 1KB regions and calculate copy number in each of these bins, then we eliminate some of this variability. And then once we account for GC content and for mappability, the signal becomes much cleaner uh, and really represents the biological data uh, to a greater extent than what we started out with. So we can start to see the events in, in, the, in a cancer. Um, so in the lab, you'll use... Hmm? What's the way of knowing the real answer? Once you're comparing this method against something, is there, is there some test data that you can artificially prepare and measure this? Uh, in terms of the effect of pre-processing, or or whether these of these gains, for instance, are real. Is this the real answer? Is this the, copy, the exact copy number variation? I mean, you could biologically validate that in your samples using fish probes. That would be the ultimate uh, validation of you know this copy number gain, for instance. Uh, you could use other methods. Um, yeah. that work in a different way. You, yeah, many people would, so there's, so you could PCR across breakpoints for inversions and translocations, which are not very well represented here. That's actually a big advantage of the whole genome approaches over SNP arrays is that you can start to see translocations and other kinds of copy neutral events uh, that are just invisible on the SNP6 platform, right? It's, on SNP6, you can look at copy number gains and losses um, and LOH, hmm? yeah at the resolution of the SNPs, uh, which I think are on average about 700 base pairs apart. So that's pretty much going to be the resolution of your breakpoints, right? Whereas with whole genome data, often you can have a much higher resolution. Uh, if you're in a repeat region, then your resolution is going to be slightly uh, affected, so you won't always have base pair level resolution. Um, but for, you know, for deletions, it's easy. You would design primers on both ends and prove that you get a band for the deletion versus the, the wild type. Uh, same for translocations, inversions, and so on. Um, I think there are some gold standard data sets that have had a lot of sequencing and that people use to compare different algorithms for um, in order to assess sensitivity and specificity. So... Mm. I see what you're getting at, yes. Yeah, yeah. your chance, yeah. So the reproducibility is, is a bit tough, and the uh, copy number events are not as, uh, yeah, they're not as robust as mutation calling, for instance. And even mutation calling has problems, so. 
um, big events or events with a high copy number, I would say, are more believable than small changes uh, or changes with, with a lower copy number. <laughs> so <clears throat> once we have this pre-processed and normalized data, uh, and you can see here that we have these regions of going up and down across uh, this chromosome, segmentation is applied. So this is basically the step where we have these different regions, um, or we have these different regions that have kind of a concordant copy number for a while, and then they change to a different copy number. So segmentation is basically inferring where the start and end of your event is. Um, and so this particular um, chromosome has about 30 segments that each differ in copy number uh, from the previous segment and from the next segment. Um, it's possible to do exomes. It's very desirable because it's much cheaper. Um, so there's a lot of interest in performing this type of analysis on exomes. When you have exome data, uh, you're only working with about 1% to 2% of the data you get from a genome. So it's actually a bit more difficult, uh, and it took a lot longer for methods to become available that did a decent job at working with exomes. Um, and so... Um, now, there are definitely tools that you could use if you have exome data, um, and there are plenty of samples in TCGA, for instance, uh, uh, which have exomes and, and copy number events um, inferred from those exomes. Okay, so this is the slide I showed before, which shows the super clean example of the typical features we look for in a copy number analysis, right? Gains, single copy gains, amplifications, single copy, and homozygous losses. Uh, what this doesn't show us are subclonal events, which we know are prevalent in cancer genomes. And so how can we find those? Um, they actually show up as weaker signals that are centered around non-integer copy numbers. So instead of going from 0 to minus 1 to minus 2, you'd go from 0 to minus 0.2. Um, and again, that would, goes back to Francis's comment about um, can we robustly find copy number events? Uh, that problem gets even um, um, worse when we consider these subclonal events. Uh, but basically, the tool you're running in the lab, Titan, uh, can predict subclonal events. Um, however, I think the data that you're using has mostly clonal events, except possibly one small subclonal deletion, right? So the example is yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's because we can't really use patient data in the context of the CBW. So uh, uh, if you do have patient data, then it's much more feasible to, um, to find subclonal events. Uh, so basically, they would show up. So here we have, oops. Um, so here we have area, an area of the genome that's diploid. We see it here in blue. And we see a single copy loss here in green, and you can see that the subclonal events, uh, the losses are just a little bit under the, um, the diploid line, but not quite as pronounced as the, as, the, um, as the single copy loss. And in contrast to the single copy loss, where you go from, in the BAF plot, from a 0.5 heterozygous state, and you lose that heterozygosity, um, in these regions, you see you don't completely lose the heterozygosity, but you kind of go away from it. Uh, and so that's sort of what the data would look like in, these, um, in some of the examples that, um, or you, you would have subclonal events. Um, so in the lab, you're going to use Titan, as I mentioned. The conceptual framework for this tool uh, is that we profile um, typically a matched normal and a tumor sample. And we look at those positions uh, in the normal and the tumor where we have a heterozygous SNP. Uh, so that determines the positions of interest that are going to be informative for this analysis. So this is going to be about 3 million SNPs per individual on average. And every one of these positions, uh, you count the alleles. Um, so that's kind of, so allele A versus B. Um, and then you apply a statistical model that takes these genotypes and coverage as input and tries to learn where the copy number and loss of heterozygosity segments are. And then it tries to determine their cellular prevalence. Uh, so you can see here, in the normal, there was a heterozygous event, three reads versus four reads for the A and B, and you go to homozygosity in the tumor. So you have five reads supporting just one allele. Question, How yes? differentiate the purity of the tumor during this analysis? 
So there is a there is a step where it tries to infer purity. So just conceptually, um, in this, Hamza, do you know the exact way uh, Titan calculates purity? Um, I'm not sure about the exact way, but I think what it does is it assumes any condition that would have a copy number two and is still hepatitis would be your normal contamination. And then it determines subclonality based on the degree of gains um, in any other conditions that are assigned. But it's basically it's trying to minimize the distribution or the standard deviation of your immediate frequency, given that you might have normal contamination for the next one. So the conceptual way to um, I guess the conceptualization of that answer is shown here where you have a sample where you have 80% tumor purity, 70% tumor purity. So these would be different parts of the region, uh, regions of the tumor. Um, and you put them together to get an average, right? So you can think of this as a clonal mixing example. So in sample A, you have a homozygous deletion, or sorry, actually a one copy deletion and a one copy gain. And in sample B, you have a one copy deletion. And when you merge this, these data together, because this gain is only in a subset of tumor cells, you're going to see it averaged to a lower frequency. Um, and then the cellular prevalence is estimated, so there's an overall estimate of, um, uh, of normal contamination. So in this case, it's 25%. So all these signals are going to be upper, like a maximum percentage of the possible signal because of this normal contamination. Um, it turns out, so Titan has been benchmarked uh, against other tools. Um, it does, all tools do pretty well for clonal events. Uh, for subclonal events, uh, Titan outperforms the other tools. And so this is a, a good way to, to approach this type of copy number calling uh, and improve your sensitivity for subclonal events. Uh, so just to finish with a nod towards emerging technologies like single cell uh, DNA sequencing, um, the idea is instead of deconvoluting these mixtures from bulk cells, essentially, that are intermixed with normal cells, uh, you can directly measure the DNA content of individual cells. Uh, so you can directly measure co uh, clonal composition. And so the, in this uh, paper, um, um, this paper describes single cell sequencing from a triple uh, negative breast cancer sample. So here you see the frozen tumor. Um, and then cells are individually dissociated. Um, the DNA content of nuclei is shown here. So some, uh, some nuclei are diploid, some are hypodiploid, and some are aneuploid. So they, they have uh, copy number gains or maybe have even undergone a genome duplication event. Um, and you can cluster the copy number of these cells and show that actually these diploid uh, cells are the ones that are normal. So when you do sequencing and you sequence for uh, mutations, or, or you infer muta you call mutations and copy number events, you can see the normal cells, which are diploid, have essentially nothing happening. And the tumor cells, which are these hypodiploid uh, or aneuploid cells, have um, events uh, in many genes. And you can see the population structure start to emerge because uh, you can appreciate that a small subset of cells have particular drivers. Um, and these other cells, which share a lot of events in common with, with the tumor cell population, have a non-overlapping set of drivers. Um, so this data is not necessarily cheap or easy uh, to generate or work with. Uh, there are certainly biases with this kind of data, but there are many efforts um, ongoing to couple these single cell and bulk measurements together. Um, and so as the technology evolves and becomes cheaper, we will see more and more insight into this clonal evolution of cancer from this type of single cell experiments. Unfortunately, we're not going to do uh, single cell, um, uh, uh, we're not going to do anything with single cell data in the lab today, but Titan can be used for single cell analysis. And so uh, if you look back at last year's lab, I think you could use those methods for if, if you guys want to uh, try it out on single cell data. Uh, that would be one way to do it. So I'm just going to end here and just summarize. Uh, the genome architecture is fundamentally important in cancer. Um, somatic copy number aberrations will change gene dosage. Uh, so that's uh, the functional consequence of these aberrations, um, specifically for oncogenes and tumor, suppressor, tumor suppressors. Uh, we can measure these aberrations in um, 
a few ways. So SNP6 and whole genome is what you guys will, will talk about next in the lab. Um, and this really, you know, is an opportunity to, to find therapeutic opportunities for tumors. So, um, and not only that, but to track these clonal populations in tumors and see what events are going to be responsible for recurrence um, or uh, metastasis or resistance to therapy. Um, some tools that um, are common in the field, including the two we are going to use. Uh, it's a good resource, and I'm happy to take any more questions uh, and have some coffee. Thank you.